In December 1966, the Labour government set up the Decimal Currency Board. Its job was to oversee the conversion of LSD Britain to pounds and new pence Britain. Its 50 civil servants had just four years to get Britain ready for its second D-Day. To mastermind the operation, they called in the expert. I was delighted when someone from the Treasury rang me up and said, would you like to come and resume? It's like your calling, really, isn't it? Yes. Well, yes, it's altogether decimalisation took seven and a half years of my career. Getting on for a quarter of it, which is not insignificant, to use a white hole expression. <laughs> you change people's money. I mean, that's money's next to sex. That's what's closest to people's hearts, isn't it? So you need somebody who's going to say everything's going to be fine. And that's exactly what Norman Moore did. Moore and his team investigated every tiny aspect of the decimal changeover. Board engineers became experts at converting machinery, while the research group conducted experiments to see how shoppers coped with the new coins. One lady uh, set up uh, a stall with dual pricing and so on, and uh, everybody um, in the research group uh, went along to see how they would manage actually using coins in day-to-day -day transactions. And one or two of uh, the staff were, I think, slightly thrown uh, by the fact that uh, most of the items on this stall from which they were selling seemed to be items of female underwear. And I think they were put off their stride. You know, this is, this is 30 years ago. People acted differently then. <laughs> Before Britain goes over to decimal currency in 1971, some 6,000 million new coins will be minted. The approved designs are engraved onto plaster casts and the final plaster mould given to the Royal Mint so that the mass production of the coins can begin. The Royal Mint had to prepare for the largest change of small change ever undertaken. They'd worked out a plan of phasing out old coins and introducing new ones before the changeover, nicknamed D-Day. The first new coins rolled out in April 1968. They replaced the shilling and the two shilling piece. We're not going decimal until 1971. But the Decimal Currency Board is preparing for the changeover by putting these two new coins into circulation now. Five new pennies equals a shilling. Ten new pennies equals two shillings. But the most controversial new coin was the replacement for the old ten shilling note, the new 50 pence piece. I don't think more research has ever been done on any coin before introducing it than was done on the shape of the 50 pence piece. Psychologists developed tests to find a shape that wouldn't get confused with other coins. Volunteer housewives fumbled around in bags testing out the distinctiveness of four, six, ten and twelve-sided shapes. The winner was a rank outsider. I believe it was a member of the board called Conway who came up with the, the seven-sided coin and everybody, everybody in the board, myself included, thought that was just terrific. I mean, it was really neat. An equilateral curve heptagon, everybody got that very quickly. And the fact that it was rolled like a round coin and you could feel it like a, like a, a coin with sides. Design was the name of the game in the 60s. New things were good. To start with, the 120 million of these 50 new penny coins will be minted, the first coins of this unusual shape the world has ever seen. The shape might have been revolutionary and also 1960s, but for the design, the Royal Mint played it safe. They reckoned that the Battle of Britain fellas used to get what you've got. 
It was big news in the rover's return when the strange new coin was introduced in October 1969. Two slim lion tonks. <laughs> no, it's my turn. Aye. Hey, try pushing your foreign coins off on somebody else. But that's not a foreign coin. It's worth ten shillings. Hey? It's one of the new ones. By the egg. Fifty new pence. What will they think of next? Mm. The public on, was equally bemused. Three or four in the till already. What do you think of this then, the new ten bob bit? Well, I think it's absolutely rubbish. I Why? think the people that designed it want to go to school and learn how to do the job. What's so wrong with it? Well, what is wrong with it? Too much like a two shilling piece for a start. Mm -hmm. Complicate all the old ladies uh, with, with money. It's hopeless for them if they get more than one two shilling piece in the first. I'm, I'm not very keen on them myself. I like the old ten bob better. Oh, the dear old ten bob. The dear old half quid. The ten shilling note. Yeah, well, the ten bob note was, was a note that you were always glad to have in your pocket. The last ten shilling note was, was taken home by me. I put it in a wallet or a note case or something like that. I've got it somewhere anyway. The ten shilling note was a regal thing. And you compare that with that dreadful thing we've got today with seven sides. You know. We were taken aback when the uh, public reaction and the press reaction was as unfavourable as it was. Almost hysterical reaction, if the truth were known. I remember when, they, when the 50p first came in, the words disaster and monstrosity appeared in headlines. The um, Prime Minister's opponents said that it was like Wilson, you know, it was two-faced, many-sided and slippery. I don't like them. They're too easy to get mixed up with half crowns and two shilling pieces. When you have some more silver in your hand and put it, put this in with your hand, it, uh, you can't tell whether it be a two shilling piece in or a ten shilling. I seem to remember a story in the press about someone who'd uh, trained a chimpanzee unfailingly to distinguish between the uh, the shape of a florin and a 50 pence coin. Now, if chimpanzees can do it, you know, it's not too bad for the rest of us. Up to now, from the public's point of view, little seems to have been done by the board, but behind the scenes, a lot of preparation has been going on. With work on the new coinage well underway, the decimal currency board set about winning hearts and minds in the business world. The most important contribution to the changeover that the Decimal Currency Board did was persuading businesses that they needed to take action early. It's not just that their machines would be affected, it's also that their accounting systems, their cash handling systems would be affected, their prices would be affected, their payroll would be affected their relations with banks who were going to decimalise on D-Day would be affected. It was a gradual, grinding, detailed process that you had to get people to do something and to do it early. We'll see, there are three denominations in the LSD system and only two in the pound pence system. Up and down the country, tens of thousands of lecturers gave hundreds of thousands of talks. Britain's small businessmen and business ladies thrilled to the nitty-gritty of the new system. And then came the highly charged battle of the sixpenny piece. As the newly appointed Labour minister in charge of decimalisation, it fell to Dick Tavern to announce that the sixpence was to be phased out. It was not a popular decision you get a certain sort of emotional argument surrounding coins. Look at the campaign now, save the pound. Well, it doesn't terribly matter whether you have a pound or a euro. There may be good economic reasons against or for having a euro, but just the familiarity with an old 
a coin like a pound is rather irrational. Well, that sort of argument surfaced very much for the sixpence. We must hang on to our sixpence. And it became the sort of symbol for the housewife. The housewife wants to keep the sixpence. It loves the sixpence. And a great emotional campaign of save the sixpence was launched. Worries about scrapping the sixpence became more serious in early 1917. London Transport announced that old machines that took sixpences couldn't be modified to take new decimal coppers. Fares would have to double to a shilling, or 5p, as a result. London Transport were entitled to take the view that they did, but of course it put into the public mind that uh, it meant higher prices inevitably uh, as a result of decimalisation. And that was not what we wanted the public to think, least of all coming towards a general election. The general election was just four months away. The Conservative Party, which had once argued for scrapping the pound, now came out fighting for the sixpence. The Conservatives thought they wanted a good thing. They were sort of linking decimalisation with popular fears of inflation. And they launched a separate debate to criticise the government for the coins which were being introduced as part of decimalisation. The vote in the Commons was... was around the sixpence was the most serious moment of the whole campaign. The old evening news took a poll and of course everybody wanted the sixpence. It was said that the housewife was up in arms about the sixpence, uh, the consumers got worked up about the sixpence and a lot of Labour backbenchers now got worked up about the sixpence. Bill Rogers, a minister at the Treasury, had the job of defending the decision to scrap the sixpence during the debate in Parliament. I had a message on that day at about 12 o'clock, I think it would be, at the end of the morning, yes, Cabinet had confirmed the sixpence was going to go. So I knew my brief. But nothing was ever that straightforward with Harold Wilson. After Cabinet, the Prime Minister met Lena Jager, the ringleader of the Labour backbench sixpence supporters. Instead of saying, sorry, uh, it, the sixpence is going, he led her to believe in some way that there was scope still for argument and the sixpence might be saved. Now, I was um, uh, waiting to make my speech and I saw the evening news and the headline said, the sixpence is saved. And the story was that Mrs. Jager had come out of number 10 uh, saying the Prime Minister had agreed the sixpence would save. It was, I think, the worst speech I made in 11 years in Parliament. I could say the Prime Minister's been lying, but I could hardly say to my own backbencher, you've misunderstood the matter. It was such a mess. Despite Rogers' blushes, the government won the debate and then promptly did a U-turn. The sixpence could stay. After all, there was an election to be won. In the event, saving the sixpence did Labour little good. Ted Heath arrived in Downing Street with just seven months to go before D-Day. Despite previous Conservative policy on the 10 shilling system, the new government decided it was too late to change. I regret still, personally, that we didn't bite the bullet in a sense and, um, and, and go for the 10 bob system. I think we would have... Uh, been better able to cope with inflationary pressures had we done so. For those who aren't trained, Monday the 15th of February could be a black Monday, with the following weeks just nightmares. With D-Day now just weeks away, the Decimal Currency Board was having nightmares of its own. Ignorance and hostility were widespread. Can you tell me something about decimalisation? No, I can't tell you. No, I don't know nothing about it. Nothing at all? No. If you'd gone out and asked people, do you want to change the decimal currency, nine out of ten people would have said no. Well, okay. what about your customers? Oh, Will you yeah, be able to yeah. give them the right change? Well, the customers won't understand it either. If I won't be able to understand it, will they? You could perhaps, with hindsight, say that there wasn't enough democracy in the decimal currency project from the beginning. V-Day, D-Day, D-Day. People really hadn't been brought along with the project. They'd just been told that it was going to happen. I would have thought it someday in June, but I'm not quite sure of him, no. I can't really say, definitely no. I suppose you could say that uh, early 1970s and middle of 1970 were rather dark days for the Decimal Council Board. June 44. There was a kind of 
faltering, a slight hesitation, a wondering. June 6, 1944. 15th of uh, February, 1971. 